Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> My name is Adrian Markish, and I am the publisher and editor of ModernAnalyst.com, the premier online community for business analysts. I would like to welcome you to today's webinar titled Visualizing an Electronic Record System, a Case Study for BAs. Today's featured speakers are Rick Farrell, Senior Project Manager, and Nicolette Driggers, Senior Analyst and UI Designer, both with Business Intelligence, Inc. They will be presenting alongside Mitch Bishop, Chief Marketing Officer of iRISE. The webinar will last approximately 60 minutes, including a Q&A session. So make sure to submit your questions in advance using the questions feature of the webinar software. I would also like to say thank you to iRISE for sponsoring this event. At this time, I will turn over to Mitch to get us started. Thanks, Adrian. I appreciate the introduction. Uh, if we could go to the next slide. Um, uh, thanks to everybody. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are uh, for attending. I wanted to uh, set Rick and Nicolette up here with a brief introduction about visualization, since some of you may not know what that means um, or what it is. But um, I'll spend about five minutes, and then we'll turn it over to our keynote speakers. Um, it was uh, really interesting. I actually just got done uh, meeting with Gary Beach from CIO Magazine last week, and um, all the latest CIO Magazine survey results, um, Information Week survey results, Gartner Group survey results, show that IT under organizations are under incredible pressure right now. As, uh, it's probably not surprising. But um, across the board, what we're seeing is um, incredible pressure on budgets, IT budgets, and that's having a material effect on, uh, on projects and a material effect, of course, on uh, business analysts as a result. But what we're hearing is that, obviously, the number one issue facing sales today is how can they dramatically cut their costs? Um, and a lot of them are using this recession, actually, as a way of finally breaking the glass on um, addressing some endemic issues that have been uh, going on for years and namely um, the issues of application rationalization and global sourcing. Now, uh, next slide, please. So um, they're really looking at application rationalization as a way of not only cutting cost, but um, either returning cash back to the business or then taking those savings and driving innovation. Uh, some of the leading companies, um, if you look back in history, have used recessions as a way of actually putting the the pedal to the metal, if you will, on innovation and coming out um, ahead of the game when the recession ends. So rash application rationalization is really one of the top issues that we're hearing IT leaders talk about. The next slide, um, we'll also, we're, he we're hearing that uh, global sourcing and accelerating global sourcing and going the last mile, if you will, towards uh, sourcing efforts that are already underway is another, huge, is another huge opportunity to cut costs. And um, uh, between rationalization and global sourcing, we're seeing that this is the strategy now towards uh, really converting maintenance dollars into innovation dollars and really starting to give some flexibility to IT organizations. Now, the good news in all this for business analysts is that um, although discretionary projects are a lot of, many times on hold or have been delayed, I think that uh, once we crack the code on converting these maintenance dollars through rationalization and global sourcing efforts, uh, there's going to be an explosion of new project activity as we move forward. Next slide. So you know, business software is a critical link that's supposed to help meet these challenges. And if on the next slide, um, what, what we're seeing in the market, obviously, is that um, the way that business software is designed, developed, and delivered is basically just fundamentally broken and has been broken for quite some time. You know, all the latest Standish Group, Chaos Report, statistics, uh, the stats from Forrester and Gartner show that well over half of software development projects fail. And on the next slide, uh, we start talking about how, uh, from our perspective, we really see that there's two issues here. One is that uh, business users really don't know what they want until they see and interact with it. And the interact portion is really important here because um, business users are not technical. Um, as BAs, I'm sure many of you face, face this issue every day. 
um, what they really want to be able to do is is play with the system. And of course, in in the current uh, model, the the first time they get to play with software and actually interact with it is when it's already been through QA. And by then, of course, it's well documented that making changes is literally a hundred times more expensive than making a change early in the process. The second issue that we're seeing is that um, the, the tools that BAs have to use uh, today are really difficult for business users to interpret, um, namely text specifications, use cases, Visio um, you know, screenshots from in PowerPoint and, and so on. When you're sitting with the business user, oftentimes there's a lot of confusion in trying to communicate with the business user what we're trying to get accomplished. And they have a lot of time trouble communicating back to the business analyst what they want. And of course, then we're turning around and, and handing off these giant static documents to downstream organizations. So it's no wonder that there's a lot of confusion, there's a lot of rework. On the next slide, um, you know, the business impact is, uh, is dramatic. Um, we see this every day with our customers. Um, and our prospects and companies that we talk with, that there's a lot of rework, there's long cycle times, partic particularly with requirements, and um, many times there's, there's poor adoption because you're not able to test the software directly with users um, prior to it being built. Uh, and really, uh, with these tools and this process, really take global sourcing out of the equation for many IT leaders because um, you really just, it's too risky. So um, on the next slide, what the, what the answer really is, is is visualization. And we're going to talk a lot today about visualization. Rick is going to talk about it. Nicolette is going to show you what visualization is all about. But visualization is the ability to quickly assemble working previews of the application directly in front of the business stakeholders and rapidly iterate to um, a, a result that is much better. A simulation or a visualization is a preview of the, of the final result, and it's an exactly mimics not only the, the look and feel, but the behavior of the final application as well. So we'll talk some more about that later. But So um, now uh, on the next slide, what you see is that the, pr the fundamental uh, communication process is transformed. As business analysts, you're now uh, presenting something uh, to your business stakeholders that looks, acts, and and uh, feels like the final application. They can give you meaningful feedback early in the process. We like to say IRIs let you fail early and cheaply versus failing late and expensively. And then uh, once you've got the visualization completed, it becomes just another artifact that you send downstream that uh, results in almost literally no rework, um, and downstream organizations can get a head start on what they do. On the next slide. Then uh, what what our customers are telling us is that um, in general, you know, your mileage may vary, but our, we have um, a lot of customers that are telling us they get to market twice as fast with 30% less project cost. And in this this kind of a recession, getting to market fast with a lot less cost is is uh, a huge huge improvement over over what we've seen in the past. Our business is growing dramatically and. Um, really, again, I think the recession is finally providing the, the, the impetus to, to solve this endemic problem that's been around for years. So um, on the final, my final slide, I mean, our vision is that um, in 20, whoops, sorry, uh, one more slide. We get asked a lot, you know, what can you visualize with iRise? And uh, you can visualize uh, packaged applications, you can visualize custom uh, web-based applications, portals, even iPhone applications. And uh, we have customers that do all of this. Um, and uh, what you really want to use iRise for are applications with user interfaces. And I uh, apologize for that. So one uh, final slide. Uh, our vision is that very shortly here, all business software is going to be visualized before you, you code it. It just makes sense. You wouldn't dream of, of uh, designing a new airplane or a new car with drafting boards anymore. You would use CAD tools. and. 3D visualization and modeling tools. So that's a brief introduction to what visualization is. And uh, with that, I will turn it over to Rick from Business Intelligence. Thank you, Mitch. And I want to thank everybody today for uh, coming and
for uh, iRISE for giving us this opportunity to share with you some of our lessons learned and uh, best practices from using uh, iRISE Studio to uh, visualize workflow. Um, the case study we're going to share with you today, uh, as I said, shares some lessons learned and best practices from using the iRISE Studio tool uh, as we did some workflow and optimization analysis and uh, human computer interaction optimization that BI did for uh, under contract to the Veterans Health Administration Office of Emerging Health Technologies during 2007, uh, 8, and 9. Now, um, any of the information I'm going to share with you today uh, or reference to uh, specific commercial products, processes, or services by uh, trade name, trademark manufacturer should not be implied to constitute an endorsement or recommendation uh, or favoring by the U.S. government. And the views and opinions expressed by us herein are not necessarily those of the U.S. government or the Department of Veterans Affairs. So uh, a little bit about BI first. Um, we're located in Fairfax, Virginia, just outside Washington, D.C. We are a service-disabled, veteran-owned small business. It was founded in 2006. And we focus on providing subject matter expertise and professional services to assist enterprises in transformation of enterprise data into actionable information. So we specialize in healthcare, um, workflow analysis, program management, uh, service management operations, and our primary client base is the U.S. federal government um, and its various agencies. So let's start with what did we achieve, and then we'll share with you how we got that. Um, as I said, we were charged to, to look at some uh, workflows and human-computer interaction. And using simulation and the visualization tools, the iRISE Studio tool set, uh, our team was able to create a, a work context where we were able to overcome uh, clinicians, doctors, and nurses' uh, skepticism and reluctance to participate in the study, in the analysis. In fact, we found the iRISE tool set was so easy to use, it became transparent to uh, the clinicians, and our analysts were able to really focus on what the clinicians were saying and the needs they were expressing. So as a result, we were able to come up with uh, roughly 34 specific recommendations um, impacting eight specific tasks that have the potential that, if implemented, to save each clinician about 28 minutes a day. Now, the overall impact for this is that it has the potential for improving clinician interactions with the system, improving how their satisfaction using it. It gives them more time, potentially, to interact with the clients. And some of the changes that we identified, the recommendations, uh, has the potential for reducing uh, you know, medical errors, healthcare errors. So, um, so basically, what was our task? Uh, the VA asked us to assist them in taking a look at clinical workflow and response time improvement opportunities around their electronic health record system, called VISTA. Now, they were inspired in some work that they had seen done by the Massachusetts General Hospital, uh, and they had some concerns that their existing systems were a little outmoded and inefficient. So we were asked to come in and focus on the high-value tasks, uh, and, and we worked from what the clinicians view as high-value. So they weren't necessarily the most frequently performed tasks, but they were things that were important to the delivery of care and that the clinicians, the users themselves, thought were important. We were asked to uh, try to keep our analysis focused on changes to the existing system, optimizations, not uh, replacement, but enhancements using the existing functionality and looking for ways to optimize it. And then to validate those recommendations back with the, uh, the clinicians themselves. So, let me talk to you a little bit about your client. Uh, the Veterans Health Administration, um, who we were under contract with, is uh, their mission is to serve the needs of America's veterans, providing uh, primary specialized care and related medical and support services. 
And the office we were supporting, the Office of Emerging Health Technologies, is tasked to sense and extend their technology horizon, looking at the application and introduction of technologies and practices. So overall, if you look at the numbers, you'll see here that the VHA is the largest integrated healthcare system in the U.S., and the numbers here are, you know, large. So how did we do this? Okay, well, we tried to focus on creating what, you know, is often called a shared space or context for the clinicians and our team to interact with and to, you know, build some dialogue. So we followed a, a classic model, that is, we created an as-is or current state model of the existing task. Um, we actually then went out to uh, several of the medical facilities and met with the clinicians, and then we uh, got their inputs on how they thought they were interacting with the system. And then we shadowed them, observing how they actually used the system to see if there were any differences that came out from that. Um, we then took that information back. We created some simulation models of the changes, the recommendations, um, based upon that analysis to creating our, our 2B or potential future state. And then we went back out to those same clinicians we had met with, showed them the, the changes in a, in a simulated system, um, worked with them to see, you know, were these, um, did they meet what they were looking for? And then we try to get some estimates on, you know, how many keystrokes we were saving and the time savings we got. So, uh, and we did this basically using scenarios. Uh, the scenarios let us establish the baseline and then measure the delta from the baseline. And we, you know, like I said, use the iRISE Studio 2 effect to create those simulations. So, you might ask, well, why did we, we pick iRISE, you know? Um, we did our due diligence in, in looking out there at uh, literature research, looking at competitive tools. And, and basically for us, it, it came down to that we needed to put um, this in front of the clinicians and enable them to interact with it like they were using the actual system. Now, obviously, we weren't going to make changes to the actual system in production that's providing health care uh, information, you know, services, support. Uh, for the clinicians, so we needed a simulation tool. Uh, we needed something that was uh, lets us quickly establish that space, um, that let us do so and simulate real-time behaviors of the system. So it wasn't just the ability to do mock-ups, but we needed them to be able to walk through and see system delays and lag times um, so that we could get a realistic uh, environment. So, you know, we, like I said, we did our due diligence, made a cut through, looked at, you know, a couple of tools in-house. Um, but really for us it came down to uh, it was easy use. Our team was able to focus on our goals and, and the tool became transparent for us. And it was transparent to the clinicians and that was an important part of our success. So some of the, the key features that we, we thought were important here was one, we wanted to be able to capture existing images from the current system because that was one of our big constraints. We were looking to enhance and optimize the, the current system, not to revise it, not to replace it. Um, and we didn't have time to go through and, and build from scratch. So we wanted to be able to capture and extend the system. So we wanted, uh, like I said, capture existing images, ability to rapidly mock up and modify those, and to be able to do so in real time with the clinician. So we were sitting there with the clinicians, and if they said, well, if this could do this, this would be more useful for me. And that was important for us. Okay. And we had to be able to do it off the net. So using the, the, the Studio 2 set, we were able to very rapidly and visually communicate screen changes and changes in system behavior with the clinicians. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Nicolette. She's going to walk you through three of the scenarios, uh, looking at the, some of the high-value tasks and how we used the tool and worked with the clinicians to capture their requirements and identify optimizations. Thank you. 
As we've now stated several times, um, basically it's really difficult to describe something on paper. I can sit here and say, well, we devised a box that does this, or we devised a box that does that, but that can lead to very re unrealistic expectations. What I may think is really exciting and what may work very well in production doesn't have any functionality whatsoever. So what IRIS allowed us to do was to create a realistic expectation, a realistic model, and a realistic idea of what we can achieve. This is currently the, what we see in the, the record system as a medic medical reconciliation chart. Basically, it's very static. Uh, it just lists medications in order, doesn't really do anything. And what the clinicians need to do is compare medications. Um, we started off with compare what was inpatient medications with outpatient medications. So we took this screen and said, let's do a way that we can compare this. We used IRIS then to create a split screen that would very quickly and easily create a system of being able to double sort medications. In this case, we created it so that we could sort it by alphabetical order, by dates, by status, anything a clinician might need to do, including a match system. What IRIS allowed us to do was sit and actually do this in real time and sit and say, is this what you need? Is this what's going to help you out? It does this work. The reaction to this was staggering. For the people who have to do a manual medical reconciliation, the reaction was instantaneously excited. They wanted it in place tomorrow. Um, why hasn't it been done yet? For the clinicians that don't do medical reconciliation, we got, oh, hey, that's neat, but it doesn't really work for me. This is where IRIS came in really handy, because we could sit there and capture what would work. So a clinician for an outpatient might say, well, I need to do it by date. You know, I need to know what they were on last month as opposed to this month. Just by creating exact same screen, photocopying it over into IRIS, saying Control-C, copy-paste, adding a slightly different um, idea to it, we were then able to say, OK, does this work? Is this what you're looking for? And the resounding answer was yes. The challenges, of course, that work with us with IRIS, um, we had to figure out how to do a double sort. We had to figure out how to sort it. But IRIS, once you understood it, worked beautifully with it. It actually is very simple to be able to sit and say, now do this. Let me add a little context here for people who may not be familiar in the healthcare area. Um, it's, we mentioned we were working with the Veterans Health Administration, they're servicing and caring for our veterans. Patients on um, veterans will move around, they'll travel, and as they go across the nation, their records, electronic health records, are available at every location. So when they go and see a clinician, you know, they may, on the East Coast here, and may live in New England during the summer months and then travel down to Florida in the winter, you know, one of the snowbirds. So they may go see a, a, a clinician who has never seen them before, does not know their history of medications. So they can pull up their records, look at them, compare them to prior visits and see, you know, what medications have been prescribed and what are being used. So this ability to reconcile the medications across time is important. For those veterans who receive, you know, they come in, say, on an uh, emergency room basis or for an out care patient, and, and then they are moved in and become in, in care in the hospital, um, if they change status, then, you know, the physicians who take assume control of their care need to reconcile their medications from either what they received in the HR with their records or in their outpatient and then just double check them. This is an important critical part of ensuring that the veterans are getting the right medications and they're not getting double dosed. So. One of the exciting things about IRIS for me was the fact that I was able to get an instantaneous uh, reaction from the clinicians. In the case of medic medical reconciliation, I was um, got an instant gratification in that people mostly liked this, were excited by this. On our next example, we needed to create a space where 
patient data could be found in one place. Currently, there's one screen per patient. Clinicians have a hard time seeing all of the patients of their patient list data in one place. When I first built this, I thought it was really cool. I thought, wow, they're going to love this. This is great. The reaction that I got was, hmm, that's interesting, but it really doesn't help me. This is where IRIs could save people tons of money and time. Had we built this to production and gotten that reaction, it would then become a situation where no one would use it. It wouldn't be useful at all. By working with the clinicians, we got the reaction of, hey, it's kind of cool, but if you did this, it would make it better. Then I would use it. So we could save time and say, all right, what is that? One of the things we got was, well, I need to see what the current medications is. So we put in a click of the link. It shows now what the current medications is. They can switch from patient to patient and see what there is, um, what their vitals are, what lab results are, any sort of this sort of um, data that is instantaneous. The other thing we came up with is this is a great triage area. So this is a way that clinicians would be able to prioritize their day. They might prioritize it by how they need to walk around, um, what their most critical patients are, several different things. So we came up originally with an idea that we could um, prioritize their list based on what their lab results were, based on what their medical status is. Ideally, the system would automatically do this um, and rank it for the doctor, but they would be able to look at the results and say, hey, I know that the system said that this lab was out of range, but it's really okay. For this particular person, the trending is fine. We also wanted a way that they could see whatever the clinician's last note might be. So in this case, it's just an example of what a last note might have been. But again, we came down with the same idea of, well, this works for me, but it doesn't work for someone else. So we thought, what about a way to customize it? This screen we were able to build very quickly, very easily, make a choice, get to see another um, screen. Unfortunately, it's going to come up into this. I'm going to run this actually from IRIS. Um, one second, please. So this function really creates a dashboard for the clinician. So when they start their day, they can look at the patients they're going to see. They can you know, get up to date on their lab results, their medications. So they can plan their day, and if they need to reschedule something, that's all one place, and they know what the day has in front of them. So they didn't have to go and pull up a list of patients from another part of the system and then go in and pull up each individual record and look at it. So this is where they saved a lot of time, uh, and we were really able to help optimize the system. And in the customization feature, as you can see, this is very different. The basic little screen is the same, but what kind of information they give is different. This is where we started being able to engage people that were not part of the specific set that we were aiming for. The original set that we were aiming for was inpatient doctors who have a much more need of being able to triage their patients in this sort of format. But by talking with outpatient doctors, nurses, and clinicians, we were able to early in the stages say, well, how can we change this so that you would use it? Again, saving tremendous amount of time, money, effort. If we'd gotten this to production, the coding on it would have been very difficult to go back and add these other functions into it. And again, it would have become a useless function. One of the other little tidbits that we added into this is that you would be able to click on a patient then and go straight to their particular screen. Um, in this case, the cover sheet screen. This is our third and final example. This is an example of instead of adding huge amounts of functionality or changes, um, the previous systems don't sort. The current system doesn't really sort. So all the sorting features that you've just seen is not included on the current system. So those were very significant functionality changes. In this case, what you're looking at is mostly just a redesign of the page. Most of the data that you see is similar or the same as to what already exists. We've added a couple of little changes in that we wanted to add things that were at first glance, bring functionality directly to um, the 
clinician um, so that we could bring it and say, well, what does this work? One of the things that we added was this new note feature that if you added a new note, in this case, they have a certain um, scenario. This is a, what iRise can do as far as screen captures, just click and point. This is what their old system looks like. We didn't really care what it actually said in it. We just said, you need to click, it'll show up. Um, and then they come to a note feature. And in this note feature, you can add another note and then press OK and it will appear on the front screen. From an IRS perspective, this was very important in that we were able to combine things. We were able to combine functionality such as coding functionality, minor, minor coding functionality of do this, do that, and now I need you to sort or go retrieve data, as well as very drop, basic drop um, data, as in give me a picture of something. When I click on that picture, go to the next screen. When I click on that picture, go to the next screen. It makes it the design time on this go incredibly fast. These screens, in terms of time that it took me to do, the medication reconciliation was probably a week to two weeks. It, considered, it used a considerable amount of planning and design in the back end, but this screen in front of you took very minimal time, mostly because it was very much a picture of here, a picture there, a slight table. It made it very quickly and easily designable. Again, the reactions that we got were key. Some people liked this, some people didn't, but having that response and being able to go back to that response was important. Um, so we've gotten several, this screen originally had a different, slightly different layout. In talking with the nurses or doctors or clinicians, they were able to say, well, move this box here, move that box there. I could do that as I was sitting with them in real time. It made it really interesting kind of backhanded compliment um, was when the doctors actually started diagnosing the patients, which was a little amusing since my medications were just copied and pasted and they weren't actually real. This is important to me because if they had been sitting there looking at this at tool saying, well, I don't understand why this button doesn't work or I don't understand why I can't get there, it would have defeated the purpose of our task. We would have had to have explained, well, you just need to ignore that and move on. We didn't have to do that. We were able to say, just press this button and go, and it did. We were able to work the scenarios out very well. And I think this is what is the most important part about vis visualization and using a tool like this to actually see what you're looking at and not have to describe, well, you need to, well, in this case, you would press on that bu a button here that will call whatever. Instead, I can say, with my finger, point at it and say, press that button. The biggest challenge that we had overall um, was mostly convincing people that c computers don't make coffee, that we could ex say, this is what you can expect from this. No, we can't take it that step farther, but we can do this, or we can um, adjust it so that it will do that. That kind of a challenge and having a visualization tool from an analyst perspective was incredibly powerful. And I'm going to turn it back over to Rick to wrap up. All right. Thanks, Nicolette. So really for us, in using the tool through the simulation, um, it really became transparent. The, the clinicians actually started thinking they were working with a live working system. Um, they were able to use the existing patterns, uh, interactions that they were familiar with, and, and it really, like I said, removed part of that separation between the analyst and the clinician. So we were able to be you know, very dynamic. Uh, we were able to talk uh, and exchange information without the barriers of the tool getting between us and capture a lot of interaction information that was critical to our ability to identify optimizations that had value to the clinicians and improve how they did things and did not just save keystrokes, that they were meaningful to them. So, you know, when we look back at the, the strengths of working, you know, using a visualization tool and using iRISE here, was that it fit very well in with using scenarios to walk through the system interaction and use case elaborations. We like the dynamic wireframing that we were able to quickly design screens and associate data to the field so they got, you know, 
as Nicolette indicated, the doctors, the clinicians, started trying to diagnose using the information in there. So we were able to take real meaningful data and import it into the simulation without a lot of back-end work. Um, the models were, are retained, they're usable, um, you know, you, you can distribute them and get comments on them. We, it was important for us that we were able to simulate different response times. So we could, you know, put in processing delays and get the clinician's feedback as to, you know, did that change how uh, comfortable or what value they got there. So, and as I said, it was really simple to build the screens and model the scenarios. Next slide. Okay. Okay. Here we go. Okay. So, uh, as Nicolette indicated, it was very easy. It, when she, we were working with the clinicians, sitting right there at the laptop, to, to reorder the sequences and rerun the simulations, to have them do that. Um, so we, you know, it really helped collaboration and discussion and had some good support for, for model management tools that were important for us. So just kind of wrap up here, what do we think are some tips and, and best practices? Um, one, you have to have, a, I think, a realistic view of what you can put into the model and what needs to be left to production. We didn't try and simulate every feature on every screen. We really used the scenarios to drive uh, out the analysis of what we were trying to get from the clinicians. What were the issues that they had identified to us? What were the optimizations and changes that we had identified? So, you know, there were significant parts of each of the, the screens that you saw that had no functionality associated to them because we were really trying to target and focus on that. Um, sometimes we did run into some tool limits. We, you know, you always do. Um, so we did some workarounds in some cases there, you know, you're, you're still going to have those. So sometimes it meant that we did, um, an example here is trying to highlight and sort concurrently. So we created a version that showed the highlighting, and then we created a version that showed the sorting capabilities, and we ran them through that. Um, from the, the back end on the technical side, um, because we were using data and pop, you know, having that in the, in the simulation itself, um, we really had to manage the variables because we were trying to reuse data so as they walked through the scenarios, they saw the continuity because that's what they would see in the real system. So it, it, each screen did not just have its, its own data. Um, again, for us, we married up the, the analysis expertise and the tool expertise with subject matter experts in our domain, which is, in this case, with health, was uh, healthcare at the VA. So we had uh, subject matter experts there to help us define the realistic scenarios and behavior, and then we, uh, they helped us in the dialogue with the clinicians because they are specialists, and specialists have their own unique language. So that was, a, uh, for us, a critical part, is to make sure we had the subject matter experts paired with them. Okay. Um, really, the hands-on power, the simulation here, the changes were, were very dramatic. You know, we had gone through, done our due diligence in identifying optimizations. But when we sat down with clinicians, the individual nature of how the doctors interacted with the system really came out and really helped inform our work as we did, you know, identified optimizations and prepared recommendations because they came from a variety of specialties in the hospital. Some were, were focused on inpatient care, some were outpatient care, some were ER. So we got a, a broad range of perspectives and they all used the same system but how they approached it and used it was differently. And that really came through in using the simulation tool, uh, more so than in prior approaches I've used in my career. Um, the tool was transparent. That, that really helped us a lot. Um, and to build that critical, you know, shared space that we think is critical. But in using the tool, you still have to have appropriate processes. You still have to have subject matter expertise. And I'll, I'll kind of conclude here 
you know, wrap up is that, you know, we did this with a small team. You know, this was basically uh, two subject matter experts, uh, a business analyst in Nicolette, and uh, a task lead. And, and we were able to quickly capture and model this, build the simulations, do the analysis, identify small changes individually that, you know, over the course of a day add up to significant impact. You know, if you look at our recommendations and, and if they're implemented, the ability to save each clinician, you know, up to 28 minutes a day in an eight-hour day, that's a significant savings from very small changes. Um, so, you know, this reinforces that small changes can lead to significant results. Um, because the tool was so transparent, as we've noted, people started thinking that they were working with the actual system, and it did raise expectations as to how fast this would be deployed. And, you know, we, we had to actively work, you know, and, and, you know, to them because there is a process that has to be followed to take recommendations and, um, and get them into the field, is that, you know, they weren't going to see these tomorrow. Um, and it was great seeing the excitement. And, um, but it, it was so transparent and, and looked to be so seamless that expectations were raised. And that's a good problem to have because that helps create the demand. Okay. So, um, so I think I'll turn it back over to Mitch now for questions. And uh, thank you. Thanks a lot, Rick. That was really fascinating. Um, you know, it's funny because uh, 28 minutes doesn't sound like a lot of time, but when you add up, you know, across literally tens of thousands of clinicians, it really translates into better patient care and better patient outcomes. And I think that's, that's uh, really the huge benefit that's maybe not quantifiable in, in this case study. But the other thing that I noticed from uh, what you were talking about is that visualization has become kind of a best practice on the commercial side. Um, but the other trend that we're seeing here is that um, some of these best practices from the commercial side are now being applied to the uh, government agencies and, and departments on the governmental side that um, I, I think hold some pretty exciting things in store for taxpayers, as we're all taxpayers at the end of the day. But really fascinating stuff. We're getting a lot of good questions, so let's get right to the questions. Hey, Nicole, I had a couple of uh, quick questions for you. Mm -hmm. Um, Susan's asking, how, do you, how did you get the patient data into iRISE to be able to demonstrate the functionality? Uh, the VHA has an online system that's um, basically a demo model that they use for, to train their clinicians before they come into the VHA, to the VA system. So a lot of it was literally a screen capture that I just cut down to size um, using bitmap sort of uh, Photoshop or whatever to cut down to the size that I wanted it for iRISE. And then I just simply dropped it in. On a couple of other ones where I created tables, um, again, I just took the information and I used a standard database table set and had iRISE um, select data from the table. Great. And I'll just add something to that. So in iRISE, just to let everybody know, you can um, uh, quickly connect uh, data into your simulations through these things we call data sheets. They look and act a lot like uh, spreadsheets on purpose so that, I mean, we all know how to use spreadsheets, but data sheets can, t can contain not only textual data, but um, they can contain rich media types as well, like photos and so on. And so it's easy enough to connect um, any of that kind of data to uh, elements on the screen. Correct. And and then, you know, another quick question for you, Nicolette, that uh, is getting asked, which is, um, how much time did the clinicians grant you per session? At uh, what point in session? Um, we had, I think it was about two hours to work with them to show off our system and to have them be able to touch it and play with it and, you know, work with it in that sense. Um, we also spent time before we actually did the visualization working with them, talking with them, trying to find out what it is that they were looking for and needing. Right. We had done uh, a data collection visit where we briefed the clinicians on the process, um, got them to tell us what they thought were high-value tasks, and then we followed them for four hours on the floor. 
um, as they went about their daily routine. And then when we came back and we showed them the, the models, the optimizations we had come up with, uh, like Nicolette said, that was about two hours time with them to go through and validate that. And as we went through from facility to facility, we did share the feedback we were getting from uh, the other facilities uh, so that it was uh, a continuous improvement process. Got it. So everybody got to more or less participate in the comments from everyone else. Yes. Um, Rick, maybe this is a good question for you. How much uh, technical knowledge does it, did it take your team to, um, to adopt and learn iRise? I'm going to turn that over to Nicolette because she's the one. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'll tell you that having a technical background helped me a lot for the simple fact of I sort of knew what to look for. I knew what kind of ideas, what kind of design to put in the background. But in truth, it did not take a huge technical background at all to work with iRise. I think because of my technical background, I was able to learn pretty much all of iRise in a couple of weeks tops. Um, certainly the basic drop, how does this work, how do you get from one screen to the other, just took me a couple of hours to figure out. But I think someone who had a non-technical background would be able to spend, you know, spend some time, spend a couple of days, go through a training seminar perhaps, and learn it very quickly and very easily. Now, I would add to that the, the most significant challenge we had was not really around Nicolette learning the tool, um, but the domain. We're t working with clinicians. They are specialists. They have their own language. And, you know, we weren't going to ask them to learn our language. We needed to understand theirs. So that's why I pointed out the, having the subject matter experts on our team they were there for Nicolette when she had questions, well, why would a doctor do this or a nurse do that? And what, is the, what does this mean? She had those resources available. That was the... That's, uh, yeah, that's really interesting because no matter what your, um, what your industry, uh, it sounds like a best practice here is to pair up a subject matter expert with uh, a visualization trained uh, business analyst and uh, that can be a pretty powerful combination. As a user interface designer, which is what I was um, well trained at, we're definitely trained to talk to both the technical side and the non-technical side. And the first thing I note, notice any time I go into a project is that I need to spend a day or two getting immersed in the client's language, um, culture, Basically, how do they interact with the data, and what does it mean? And that, I would say that's a very big part of it. Got it. Um, we've got somebody asking an interesting question here, which is, you know, they're not seeing a lot of or any, you know, web top, web 2.0 or rich internet behavior in the examples that you gave, Nicolette. Um, so, uh, does can you visualize that kind of stuff? And I guess I'll start off by saying that. Yes, iRise does support the visualization of rich internet applications and behaviors. Um, there's a whole set of pre-configured widgets and functions included in the product that let you do that. Um, it looks like, I mean, this particular application uh, was, uh, didn't go down that path, but uh, have you been able to use iRise for rich internet um, applications? Um, I've not used it for rich internet applications, but I'll tell you something. I think it was actually harder to do it my way than to do it with the rich internet functionality. The reason being is that we were restricted to have the look and feel of the environment that currently exists, which in many respects is harder to deal with than what would be the, the internet side of it and making it look pretty. And I think I probably would have had an easier time working with the rich um, internet stuff. Got it. Hey, on this project with the, uh, with the VA, um, were you involved in the process of communicating downstream to the development organization, you know, uh, your, um, what you had found? Or in other words, your, your, the final visualization, how was that used with the downstream organization? Okay. Um, as I indicated at the start, we were working with the Office of Emerging Health Technologies, and their charter is to help explore, you know, advances in practices and technologies that will help improve the delivery of care within the VHA. So we prepared recommendations for them, 
and then they will take those through the organizational processes um, through the appropriate reviews and um, any subsequent analysis that needs to be done. So we've turned the models over to them, we've turned our recommendations and our findings over to them, and um, they are have the you know the ball to go forward with. So. But in that, they actually do have a version of the IRIS, so they will be able to actually look at it and interact with it in the same way that the clinicians did, which I think will go a long way. Got it. Um, <clears throat> we're getting a, a, some, a lot of questions here. I just wanted to pause and let everybody know that um, we probably, well, we definitely won't have time for all the questions live, but um, I just want to let everybody know that we will get to all of your questions and we will uh, answer them offline if we, if we don't get to them live. live. Um, another question for you, Nicolette. Um, did you capture functional requirements during the sessions with the clinicians? Or did you follow up on, on details with a smaller subset of people, like your subject matter expert? Well, we were focused on uh, the optimizations of the existing workflows. So, you know, we captured, I'm going to say, process changes. So we weren't there to reanalyze the uh, existing application, but to really look at how it was being used in the real world. And based upon those observations, prepare recommendations for changes to the workflows and optimizations for that. So we weren't really capturing requirements, functional requirements, in a traditional sense, you know, to come up with new functionality. Got it. Um, uh, here's a, a process question. How does IRIS fit into the overall requirements management process? Uh, does the VA use something like, you know, IBM Requisite Pro? Um, and, you know, if so, how does uh, visualization fit into that process? Um, that's something I can't really speak to because I'm, you know, um, we were using IRIS as, as our tool here. It was uh, BI's choice of this tool set. Um, and to support accomplishing the work. The, the VA does, I know, use Requisite Pro among other tools for requirements, but I can't really speak to, you know, the larger question. Well, I can, I can share some of, uh, you know, what our, our other customers are doing. And uh, visualization is really, as you can tell, really kind of the front end of the process. And the, <clears throat> the point of visualization is to get quickly to a common understanding of what to build and it's uh, really not a requirements management tool, per, you know, at all. And so there is kind of an interesting um, marriage, if you will, of what are we building with how are we building it. And um, the requirements management products that we see out on the market, like Rick Pro, are really meant more for developers and um, get deep into things like traceability of requirements. Uh, we've actually built an integration between IRIS and IBM Requisite Pro. Uh, we've also announced an integration coming soon for the IBM Rational Composer product, which is their next generation of requirements and definition suite. And um, uh, so we really see visualization taking its place at the front of that process as a way to rapidly get to a common understanding of what to build. And then the development team and downstream organizations use um, uh, Rec Pro and other tools to um, manage the process of, of how, to, how to build it. So hopefully that helped. Um, Nicolette, here's another question for you. How did you incorporate the visual design elements into your iRISE project? Can you clarify that? I'm not sure I understand that question. Well, I think what they're getting at here is that um, this idea of, of copying and pasting screenshots and other visual elements, um, was that a difficult thing or how did you do that? Okay. Um, no, that was not a difficult thing at all. It, it really worked a lot like um, you might do even honestly a Word document in many respects. Uh, basically I wanted to insert a picture of, whether it be a picture of data, a list of data, or an actual picture. I could just simply 
take that as a JPEG and insert it very similar to like you would insert it into Word. Some of the larger, um, my background, for instance, my background on the iRise is actually a picture. It's a screen capture. But the layers that layer up to the top part is iRise has its own sort of drawing tools where you can enter a box with a label. You can enter um, shapes or text um, tables, that kind of thing. So it was really not difficult at all, and it very much followed the same sort of pattern that you would use for a lot of other programs. Got it. Um, this is a really interesting question. Uh, given the fact that there are probably lots of clinicians that you spoke with, um, and I'm assuming that you would get maybe conflicting um, observations or conflicting feedback on the simulations, how did you manage the uh, change requests in that kind of environment? Um, we absolutely did get a lot of conflicting um, feedback. Uh, there was differences between inpatient doctors, outpatient doctors, difference between inpatient doctors and nurses, inpatient. I mean, there were basically four subset groups that all would have their own opinion. Uh, it depended on what the conflicts were. For many of them, it was a simple matter of, you know what, the best thing to do in this case is understand that one size does not fit all. One size very rarely fits even one and say, okay, customization. How would you customize this? What would you do to make it so that it would fit? Which is how we got into the dashboard of being able to say, if I select I want these data points, I can select them, or if I don't want them, I can take them off. Most of the conflicting reports were able to um, be taken care of in customization. Some of the other ones, um, actually policy helped us out in terms of that we might have gotten a nurse that says, no, I want it to absolutely go this way, but because of the safety regulations of the federal government of the healthcare system, we could say, no, it needs to actually follow one of these patterns. And then sometimes um, the conflicting, we just left out of the simulation entirely as being that would have to come down in a different way. Um, but most of the time what happened was when there was conflicting that couldn't be resolved through customization or policy, was it created a very interesting argument back and forth, and most of them came to a consensus on something, um, whatever we were able to do. Got it. Well, I think we have time for one more question. Um, it's a really good question, and we'll try and get to a quick answer to it, which is how does the use of iRise change the way that business requirements are delivered to the application development team, is it an add-on only or a replacement to some portion of the requirements? And I guess I'll take this one and just let um, everyone know that uh, this is actually a really great question because it, it, it hits at the core of, of the process. And we get asked all the time, how does iRise fit into the process? And what I can share with you is a best practice that our customers are seeing is that iRise visualizations become one of many artifacts that you are uh, delivering downstream to the development organization, to the QA organization, to documentation and training. And um, interestingly, visual visualization, I think, becomes a way that those downstream organizations uh, get a head start on what they're doing. So not only are you able to shrink requirement cycle times, but you're able to shrink the amount of time that it takes downstream organizations to get going. What we found is that um, delivering only a visualization to downstream organizations is uh, not currently a best practice out there because those downstream organizations um, already expect you know, functional specs. They expect other things, other artifacts that you may be already producing. So the short answer is iRise fits into whatever process you've got in place right now. You don't need to change your process dramatically. Um, and a visualization over time, we think, would become a more and more important um, artifact in that suite get, that gets um, delivered downstream. In fact, you can generate your functional specs right out of iRise, which many of our customers do. So with that, I'd just like to remind everybody that uh, if you want to try iRise out, you can download a free trial from our website. There's free e-learning available from our website, all sorts of uh, case studies and uh, free iDocs that you can download to, you know, uh, accelerate your learning around the product. And I'll you know, go ahead and give it a try. And with that, I'll hand it, hand it back over to Adrian. And uh, thanks, Rick and Nicolette. Great job today. 
Uh, yes, thank you everyone again for attending this webinar and many thanks to Rick, Nicolette and Mitch for a very informative presentation. I wanted to point out that the webinar along with the slides will be archived at modernanalyst.com within the next few days. This concludes our event. Thank you again and we hope you have a great day.